the two areas that contribute to weight are your fingers and your mouth. <laughs> If you can control those two, you are in control. You are listening to the Dr. Haley Show, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your health. Each episode, there will be an interview or a message to help you discover better health. We will be featuring health radicals on the show to bring new ideas to the table, as well as doubling down on key fundamentals to support you living your best life. Your host is no other than the founder of Haley Nutrition, Dr. Michael Haley. This is the Dr. Haley Show podcast. I'm Dr. Michael Haley, your show host. Today's guest is Dr. John Puthalil. He practiced medicine as a pediatrician and allergist for more than 30 years. He retired in 2008. He holds certifications from the American Board of Pediatrics, the American Board of Allergy and Immunology, and the Canadian Board of Pediatrics. Through his clinical experience and years of research, Dr. Putlil has developed and investigated new theories to the cause of diabetes that challenges the insulin resistance theory. He's authored several books on this topic. Enjoy the show. You know, it's funny. Anytime you do a podcast like this, I know the host always says something like, I'm so excited. And usually it's just something that they say. But I got to say, I really am excited about this conversation. I, I've done a little bit of research and I've, I started reading one of your books. And this is a fascinating topic that's in front of us today. Uh, I, my wife accuses me when I start on this topic, I don't stop. <laughs> okay, well, that's okay with me. I've got a lot of time. And I was thinking about some of the things I wanted to talk about here. And I'm afraid I have too many. It's, it's like, oh, there's so much good content here. We, we may have to do it another one. I'm, I'm fine with that because we both strive to educate the people that we want to help. For sure. So we are on the same boat. You have the microphone and I'm just a guest, but you, you are channeling my message to the people who need to hear. Now, do most people call you Dr. Puthalo or do they call you Dr. John? Dr. John. Dr. John is a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I noticed about you in reading your book, I was trained to think differently when it comes to diagnosing, not okay. to look at symptoms so much. Well, the symptoms are important, but we don't treat them. We look to the cause of the symptoms. And exactly. when we find the cause, we go deeper. We find the cause of the cause. Right. And that's what I see in you. And it's definitely a gift. Yes. Well, what we, look at, we look at the contributing factors that are within our reach to change. Right. So, okay. Yeah. How did this all start for you? When did you decide you wanted to be a doctor? Where'd you grow up and what led to that? Well, during my high school days, I was always curious about things, how things happen. Rather than just learn what happened, why did it happen? That led to the science. Science, you have got more opportunities. You know, why, 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 why? So that is what led me to science and to the medical school and all that. Yeah, and when you say science, because obviously there's a difference between science and, say, research. And okay. I think even now people are confused when it comes to research. They think, well, I, I went to Google and I looked up a bunch of things and they call that research. You, right. Tell me a little bit about the research you have done. I know that you've been a physician practicing for 30 years before you retired. So you have the clinical experience and then you did a lot of research during that time. What did that look like for you? Well, let, let me tell where I started. Around age 40, I noticed that I'm gaining weight. And the interesting part was I gained weight during the winter months and in the spring, I will lose it. When I reached mid-50s, I found that what I gained in the winter is not going away. So I thought I was eating the same way, exercising the same amount, still the weight is staying. 
Then he said, there's something here that I don't understand. So I went to the medical textbooks. You know, they won't tell you. Uh, let me back up a little bit. My first question to myself was, if I don't eat, I don't gain weight. Right? So what is the reason for me to eat? Now, let me ask you, Dr. Haley, a question. Can you predict when you are going to feel hungry next? You know, I can. I don't think everyone can. Right. No, but, you know, you can predict when you are going to be eating, but not when you feel hungry. So it is unpredictable. If so, how does the brain know when to create the sensation of hunger? Well, yeah. Uh, but, but, and I think that's where I was going because I, I was going to say I can predict because I know like what foods are going to provide satisfaction. Not exactly. I don't know when exactly when, but I know that if I eat a certain way, I'm going to be hungry a lot sooner. Exactly. Yeah, so but I don't know does, when that's going to happen. Correct. And why does it happen? What does the, the each time the period, the space between the sensations of hunger is different? It is not the same. So how does the brain know? Okay, now is the time you should be hungry. The second question was, each time you eat, you don't eat the same volume. Right. So how does the brain know this time you only need this much, that time you needed more? Yeah, and, and my problem is, is I swallow before I give my brain a chance to tell me the answer. Oh, yeah. Exactly. That is, <laughs> you have observed it correctly. <laughs> no, the best example is thirst. When you are thirsty, you cannot predict how much water will it take to quench your thirst. Each time it is different. And by the time you finish drinking, the water is still in your stomach. It has not been absorbed yet. So how does the brain know you had enough this time? when your stomach is capable of holding even more. The third question was, if you take your blood and test your blood sugar, cholesterol, triglyceride, four hours after a meal, let's say supper, it will be high. By next morning, it is all back to normal. So where did those nutrients go? So, I could not find answers in medical textbooks, so I came out with my own answers. That is what I published in my first book, Eat, Chew, Live. And that's the one I'm reading now. I'm only in chapter six. It's fascinating. Right. The number one cause of overweight is, as you mentioned, you eat too fast. You're not enjoying what you eat. In order to do that, you have to chew the food. So that is why I put the emphasis on chew as the middle title. All you have to do is to, I, I observed people eating. Many, many people. So that is where I started. You know, I remember Jordan Rubin from the Garden of Life. He said, chew your food 50 times before you swallow. Exactly. Now, if you make it to 50, there's nothing to swallow. It kind of all disappears. <laughs> okay. But you're really getting that digestion going. You're releasing a lot of the nutrients. You're preparing the food for your microbiome to properly consume it and do the rest yeah, of the yeah. work. Um, it makes complete sense. But why don't we do it? The best example is all you have to do is to observe a toddler. Two to six years of age, you will observe three things. One, they will eat only when they are hungry. Plenty of food in the house, but they won't eat it. Second, if grandma makes ten different items, the toddler may choose two or three, what the toddler likes. Next time, grandma may make, make the same thing more because my baby liked it but the child won't even touch it. They pick and choose what they want. And when they are done, they could care less how much is left on the plate. They would go out and play. 
And remember, we all had the same faculty between age two and six. Then That's it interesting because, yeah, our parents used to tell us, finish what's on your plate. Right. And they, if we would have done it naturally, they wouldn't have had to say that, right? Well, what happens is, you know, that works only after age six. It won't work before that. Because that is when they start listening to their parents or obeying the parents. And then starts the problem. Hmm. Let me tell you the story. I was counseling 10 adults uh, during my practice on how to lose weight. So I told them, I grew up in India and some days I didn't feel hungry. And now I know why. They said, why? Because you were all eating for me. For the starving children in India and China. Right? But finish what is on your plate. There are children starving there. So I told them, you don't have to do that anymore. And some, yeah, and somehow finishing it, somehow we saved all the starving people. I don't know how that works. Yeah. But... <laughs> now, what kind of foods did you grow up on in India? Well, because we ate in, everything. You're, you're in Oregon now, so you've been in the United States for how long? I, I came in 1970. Okay. It, was the food different when you got here? Oh, Yes. You know, we, we eat in, in India a lot of vegetables. And we ate, in my household, we ate everything. Fish, meat. Even though 85% of the people in India are vegetarians, our state was a non-vegetarian state. You know, a coastal state. We had plenty of fish and you know, fowl and everything. So I grew up eating everything. The main thing is we use a lot of spices. Which is good. Well, well, yes, excellent. When I, I from India, I went to Scotland to do a year of training, and I could not eat the the food there because they are all bland. And if you put even pepper on the food, they will say you are destroying the taste of the meat. <laughs> so I had a hard time adjusting, but. You know, at that time, when I first came, I could not eat and enjoy a McDonald's or a or a hamburger because that's not that's not spicy. Right. So sure. Anyway, sure. Well, that may have saved you. Uh, you know, <laughs> that may have been a good thing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about diabetes. Okay. And, and before talking about that, though. I want people to understand why this is so important. You know, we learn about alcohol and cigarettes as being like gateway drugs. You know, if you do, if you use these, you're more likely to use things that are more harmful. Diabetes is sort of a gateway disease. If you get diabetes, you're a lot more likely to have all these other problems. Yes. Uh, it, it's probably the cause of a lot of other diseases. It's probably the one that we should pay the most attention to and avoid the most. With that, what is it and what's causing it? Okay. You have asked a very fundamental question that most people don't understand. They're not allowed to understand. Everybody has heard the term insulin resistance. Right? Have you ever heard of a test to measure insulin resistance? I am not aware of them. I, I know that they measure sugar levels. I don't even know what A1C is, uh, what that measurement is. Okay. There is no test for measuring insulin resistance. Why? Because it does not exist. It is an explanation. It is not an actual measurement. It's a theory. It is a concept, yes. To explain the findings. But you are treated, you are being treated for a hypothesis or based on a hypothesis. Right. So therein starts the first problem. If you look at the NIH website, 
it will show you that type 2, di- I'm talking about type 2 diabetes, okay, not type 1. Type 1 is real. Mm-hmm. In type 2, it will say on NIH website, it will say type 2 diabetes starts when three cells, the liver, the muscle, and the fat tissue stop or responding to insulin. Okay? So I send them a letter. (laughs) What is the evidence? How do you prove it? So what they are saying is, if I want to challenge it, I have to disprove it. They didn't have to prove it to use it. No. You just have because to it's already it. there. Oh boy. And you know, this is the NIH, that's the National Institute of Health, supposed to be founded on research and evidence science. Right. right. Yeah. So that oh. is where so how can people know? So now the Gadget manufacturers and insulin producing companies, they support it so much. Mm. If you look at the advertisements for medications or the gadgets, it will say it will bring your A1C below seven. What it will not say is, will that lead to reduced complications? There's no connection between complication. Oh, we will bring the blood sugar down. We have done our job. I see the commercials too, and they're dancing, they're celebrating, they lowered their A1C. It's a good time, it's a party. But it doesn't necessarily mean there's a health benefit. No, in fact, my publisher's relative, he was a diabetic, we begged him you know, not to fall for this. But he said, oh, my doctor said my A1C is good. I'm on insulin, everything under control. Now he is on dialysis. Mm. Both his kidneys functions are gone. Mm -mm -mm. And my own friend who has a PhD in organic chemistry, he is one of the original ones who developed the dry powder, the Xerox powder copy machine he was taking when i met him 120 units of insulin to keep his a1c below seven he was so religiously keeping a1c and he lost three toes he developed two different cancers and he passed away Mm. but he kept his a1c below seven very religiously for 20 years yeah, and that's that's kind of what I meant by gateway disease because so many other complications follow. You know, the the being overweight and inflamed, and you know having circulatory problems, and your vision goes, and the diabetic neuropathy. Are you enjoying the show thus far? One of the many health secrets that we have covered on the show is all around aloe vera, specifically drinking raw aloe vera. Our aloe vera has helped our customers effectively heal their gut, increase their intestine health, lower inflammation in the body, eliminate and or decrease acid reflux, have glowing skin and hair, and so much more. Now, as a frequent member of our audience, you will be exposed to exclusive specials and coupon codes for the awesome products manufactured by Haley Nutrition. That's right, for simply being awesome and tuning in, you can get a mini discount to help you optimize and better your health. To see how we can help and support you on your health journey, tune into the episodes and listen for coupon codes that you can use at www.haleynutrition.com before you make your orders of raw aloe vera. Once again, it's www.haleynutrition.com. Now, back to the show. So we are controlling a symptom. When you have a in pneumonia, you have fever. If you take Tylenol or aspirin, you can bring your fever down, but that does not control the infection. Here, you are led to believe that if you control the sugar, you are controlling the medical problem, which is totally different. Yeah. You're only controlling a symptom, and that is the message people are not getting. Yeah, I I don't want to lose people on this. So let's try to 
bridge over into what's actually causing it. And in other words, we can burn different kinds of fuel. There's macronutrients, fat, protein, and carbohydrates. And we all think of our energy coming from sugars, which it does, and glycogen. But people are into these, you know, high fat, high protein diets where they're burning something else for fuel. And our bodies will do that. They will burn fats and proteins and live for a good period of time without carbohydrates and starches. So what you're finding is that people that are having diabetic symptoms are actually switched. They will have switched. Their muscles, for instance, will have switched to burning fatty acids rather than sugars. Is that correct? Yes. Let, let me, let, let's go back and explain that. That's an excellent question. That is what people need to understand. Let, let me put it in two different ways. The Native Americans in the year 1900, when they were brought to the reservation, they had complete medical examination and they had practically no type 2 diabetes. None. So the doctors wondered why, but they could not find an answer. Now, if you look at the Native Americans in reservations, for example, the Pima Indians in Arizona, 50% of the adults over age 35 will have prediabetes or diabetes. 50%. And the general population is also is going in the same direction. In about 10, another 10 years, 50% of us adults will be diabetic. Why did they not have diabetes in the native habitat? You know why? They moved from one food source to another. They ate everything, vegetables, fruits, nuts, fish, animals, but they did not eat one thing. They never stay in one place to cultivate grains. Oh, grains, okay. They did not cultivate wheat, rice, or corn. They ate wild corn. So they did not eat any of those. But in the reservation, what did they get? All bread free of charge, as much as you want, wheat and corn products. Is it the grains or is it the availability of it? All grain farming is subsidized. That is the cheapest food available. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the people in the lower economic status or all the feeding programs, we all subsidize uh, or use, use grain-based food. That's the cheapest. Sure. We, yeah. 100 years ago, the percentage of food energy each person consumed from grains was less, or complex carbohydrate was less than 35%. Now it is 50% in developed countries and 70% in developing countries. Okay. Okay. And I want a little bit of a clarification here then. Is it the grains or the quantity of grains? In other words, are grains evil? Um, do you consume any grains? in your diet, it, or are you 100% out on the grains? It, no, it is the quantity. Okay. If we can keep the complex carbohydrate from grains or any other source to less than 35% of your total daily energy, food energy intake, you're fine. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> that's, that's easy. All, that's all but, you have to do. But, but you may think it is easy. But when is the last time you had a meal or a snack without a grain product? Yeah, yeah. Well, and for me, you know, I mean, today, you know, I had my, I did have my coffee with my organic coffee, that is, with my little bit of vegan protein and coconut milk. 
Yeah. And then from there, I had a baked potato that I baked the day before and I ate it like yeah. an apple. That was my breakfast. Yeah. Uh, and I had some, I did have some quinoa today. I had quinoa with carrots. Is quinoa a grain? Quinoa is a seed. It is not a, actually a grain, but it is much better than the rice or wheat or corn flour products. Okay. So I'm kind of crossing over into that area already. Yeah, because yeah. I'm thinking for me, you know, uh, most Americans, you know, we've been taught that you have to uh, start with cereal and have the breakfast of champions, which is grain. And that's yeah. the first thing you eat. And if you don't, you know, we don't do cereal. It's, well, eggs and toast, which is wheat. And, you know, lunch comes on a sandwich, which is some stuff in between. And there's literally wheat all day long. Exactly. So I do understand where you're coming from. Yeah. So all, you know, morning I can understand because what is the organ that is most active during the night? Your heart is slowing down, your muscles are relaxed, your kidney, the organ that is still active is the brain. And the brain uses glucose. So to replace that in the morning with some grain-based food, perfectly fine. The rest of the day, you don't need it. Okay. You can eat some snack, a cookie, or even a piece of cake later on, which is fine as long as you don't eat your grain-based products, including lunch and supper. That's all I'm asking. All right. My audience is not allowed to eat cookies, okay? <laughs> they are, they are, but... <laughs> they got to be few and far between. <laughs> the, okay, now, the yeah. reality is like, and I can say for myself, I haven't had a cookie in probably at least a year. Okay. Uh, it, yeah, but, you know, treats are allowed here and there, but very yeah. carefully, cautiously. Yeah. So this way, what I'm suggesting is if you don't eat the grain-based foods for lunch and dinner, then you have a space for some snack or cookies if you want to. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah. What, what's your diet like? What'd you have today? I, I have in the morning, two tablespoons of uh, oatmeal with uh, some uh, pecan nuts and a tablespoon of raisin. You put it in half and half milk, boil it and warm it's like a porridge. Yeah, okay. Not steel cut or rolled oats? Uh, the original. Okay. Okay, because, you know, we can have oats in their oat groat form, which is like eating it almost like rice, which is delicious. Um, right. I like them when they're cut, like steel cut, which, you know, has a nice little uh, yeah. texture to it. And the rolled oats are kind of flattened out, and I don't like them as much. <laughs> a little soggy. But oats are one of those grains that you know you're kind of getting the whole shell it's not just the endosperm like right. you're getting when you're eating breads that have yeah. been super processed and with all of that extra fiber it, you're not having the sugar spike that you would from eating bread and it's more like a time released right uh glucose that your body can use so I like that option. That's a good choice. So again, it is not the type of food. It is the quantity. How much do you eat? And it's interesting. If When you drink, you don't drink. When you're thirsty, you're drinking. You don't drink until your stomach feels full. You stop drinking when the thirst is quenched. But when you eat, many people wait for the fullness of the stomach rather than reduction in the degree of enjoyment. Mm. There's a big difference. That, that is a big difference, because I thought you were going to talk about satisfaction or when did the hunger go away. Right. But really, it's the reduction of the enjoyment. When you're hungry, that first bite you take tastes so good. Oh, yeah. After about five minutes... The intensity of enjoyment is not as much. 
you know, there's uh, something that was written in the scriptures and it said, the satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb, but to one who is starving, even that which is bitter seems sweet. Exactly. Yeah. But there but- comes a point in time when, when I'm satisfied, I don't need any more. I don't really enjoy it the way I was. When I'm starving, everything looks good. Don't exactly. go grocery shopping starving. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you got the point. So, but nowadays we are so busy doing other things. Eating is just something we do because we have to do something else. You are not taking time to sit down and enjoy your meal. Okay. Think about this. Enjoyment of food or eating is one thing that you can do from the moment you are born until you die, multiple times a day. There's no other enjoyment you can enjoy multiple times a day with the same intensity every day of your life. Yeah, so the the word is to the people, enjoy your food slow down, taste it, experience the texture, and truly enjoy it, and know at what point that enjoyment decreases. Yeah, I put it in a slightly different way. Okay. We all enjoy eating, but we don't enjoy what we eat. Mm. I like that. That is well said. So that's all you have to do. You are eating anyway. Why don't you enjoy it? Very, if very you good. ask somebody how much of one bite of sandwich will they enjoy, they will say 100%. But then I'll get this example. If you put one potato chip on your tongue, you will enjoy it. If you stack 10, which one do you enjoy? Only the one at the bottom. But you're consuming all of it without enjoying. Yeah. If someone made you a special soup, when you have that spoonful, can you tell them what was in it? (laughs) Do you even know before you swallow or do you just swallow? What do you taste? What are the flavors? (laughs) So I tell people, when give your spoon or fork a rest. Because most people, you are constantly going your yeah, concentration well, is not on food in the mouth but on the next bite that you're going to yeah, eat don't tell me to give my spoon a rest when i'm eating soup because i'll just pick up the bowl <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah that i didn't think of that one <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know uh when i eat i'm guilty i like to eat and i like to you know literally shove it down and i'm not experiencing the the joy of the flavors of the food i'm just it it, it just go over your taste buds how can you enjoy it unless it comes in contact with that is where the chewing comes in the more you chew the more nutrients are released into your mouth the more are registered and the more you enjoy now how does not doing these things eventually lead to diabetes okay very good the first thing is what is your point of meal termination what makes you stop eating if you concentrate on the enjoyment part as the enjoyment decreases you stop If you don't do that, then the next thing is the fullness of the stomach. That means you have already taken in more than what your body needs at that time. And that has to be stored. In four hours, your digestion is complete. All the nutrients are absorbed. In the next four hours, the pancreas will release insulin and Now, let's go back a little bit. Every cell uses glucose to produce energy. But when glucose is outside, the cell does not know it is outside. For example, if somebody comes to your home, your apartment or your home, you know there is somebody outside when they ring the doorbell or knock on the door. 
Glucose cannot ring the doorbell. It is insulin that rings the doorbell. So insulin comes with glucose, ring the doorbell for the cell, a message is sent to the control center, glucose is outside, then the nucleus has to decide whether they need it or not. If the nucleus decides the cell can use glucose, it will send a wagon to the door, open the door, fill up the wagon with glucose and bring that in. I got you. I know where this now, is going. That, yeah. Now, if the cell does not need it, because the cell can use either glucose or fatty acid to produce energy. If the cell is already using fatty acid to produce energy, it does not need glucose. So it will not open the door even after insulin is ringing. So glucose stays in the blood. And what do you call have already come through the door. The house is full. We're at capacity. We can't have any more. That's what exactly. would happen in, you know, any event where right. there's a capacity. There you go. We can't fit any more people in here. This is our capacity. Exactly. And that's essentially what the cell is doing with the glucose. Right. You, you put it very right. Exactly. So what do the diabetologists call that? What do they call it? They call it... Uh, they, that, they, that's the okay this is where they got that word from thinking well it must be the insulin we're not it's, it's we're just not sensitive to it anymore something happened here right they say this cell is not responding to insulin it is resisting the message of insulin but the reality is is no the the, the knock on the door is there there's just no room inside the house they don't need it it is like, a, suppose you had a good meal, and let me ask you this, what is your favorite meal, food? Oh. Just give me nice one. Food. Well, you know, pizza is like the gold standard of a favorite food, and okay. I love pizza. Okay, suppose you already had a nice meal, and then I bring in a big piece of pizza, and you say, you don't want it right now. Are you resisting feeding? Uh, well, I, I'm I'm delaying it. Yeah, but you I'm still planning it. it. Exactly, that is what is happening when the blood glucose goes up because the cells are not responding to insulin because the cell function is not affected. When you are diagnosed with type two diabetes, your muscles still work, your liver still works. Your fat cells are still loading fat. There's no functional defect. So what does it mean by insulin resistance? Yeah, it means it's a term we all come to believe because we heard it so many times, which is what happens in a lot of spaces today. We hear it enough times, we actually believe it to be true. And there's a good chance that it never was. As long as you keep talking long and loud for long enough time, people will believe it. Right. So that is what has happened. There is, that is why there is no test to measure insulin resistance. Now, even more interesting is, if you are resistant to an antibiotic, the doctor will not give you the same antibiotic. Here, you are on the one hand, you are told you are a type 2 diabetic because your body is resisting insulin. And say, oh, he, by the way, here is the script for insulin for you. How does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when they take the insulin, what are the results? The blood sugar goes down. That's the only result. It does not improve the muscle function. It does not improve the liver function. You still get fat. The one of the first thing you notice when you start insulin is you gain weight. So what? But the blood sugar goes down. Where did that sugar go? That's what I want to know. It does not go out of the body. Insulin forces the liver to convert that glucose into fat. Okay. So if you measure your blood sugar, it is down. So the endocrinologists have done their job. But you know what they tell you? You did not lose weight. That is why you have problem. Hmm. 
on the one hand you are told to lose weight and then you are given a medication that makes you fat right right yeah i'm i'm having a little bit of a problem though i'm not quite making the full connection because i'm wondering why the person's own insulin didn't do that didn't make the sugar leave the blood and go into the fat cell excellent question or, or or why didn't we create new fat cells the body can create new fat cells until you are about mid 20s after that the the number of fat cells remain the same you can fill it empty it fill it empty it you cannot produce new fat cells so if you are a, a child or a growing during the growth period you will get new fat cells after that it is done the number but the quantity of fat that each fat cell can put in is genetically determined and that starts from the womb depending on how well the mother was fed if the mother did not get enough uh, excess food the baby may not have a, a large number of fat cells or the amount the volume capacity of the fat cell will also be small the baby will be lean whereas if the mother got a lot of food the baby will be plump a lot of fat cells for example in a household there may be one child who is heavy and look fatty and another child who may be lean same household Mm-hmm. now which child is likely to develop diabetic di- type 2 diabetes earlier well that would probably be me i'm thinking it's funny i'm thinking of my own family because my mother ate more for me because she was told to do that and right. in my family i happen to be born the biggest of the okay you know four of us we can look at it in different ways suppose you have two refrigerators one holds 10 cubic feet and the other 20 if you buy go to the grocery store buy the same amount of food the 10 will get filled up earlier but 20 still will have more room so you have inherited a larger capacity to store fat the excess food the liver will convert into fat and store it what is staying in the blood is what gives you trouble not what is stored outside the blood got it you may look cosmetically overweight but medically you are not hmm okay so this kind of gets into like the set point then where our you know my body is made to be a certain weight right how do we know what that is excellent question a very simple test first of all your ideal what i call the authentic body weight in this one is what you reach in your mid 20s why mid 20s you have reached the maximum height and your bone density is maximum provided your blood sugar fasting blood sugar fasting triglyceride fasting ldl is normal so any time if those three fasting blood test levels sugar triglyceride and ldl cholesterol if they are normal that is your authentic weight okay i am definitely not at my authentic weight all right how do i get back to it <laughs> okay just like we mentioned earlier you have your si- grain based foods only for morning and snacks don't eat any grain based foods for lunch or dinner that's all you have to do now if i'm doing those things and i'm obeying my my satiety okay. i'm paying attention and i'm enjoying the food and recognizing when i'm not enjoying it as much anymore and probably it's time to you know i slowed down and i've only consumed what seems right okay will my body be you know using the fat and burning it to get me back to that or do i have to actually go into a period of starving myself and intentionally disobeying hunger 
when let, uh, what is your fast is your fasting blood sugar above normal or within normal range well i haven't tested anything ever <laughs> i i'm one of those people that haven't been to a doctor in years yeah, um, yeah let's assume i have no the, idea what my blood is that is the only way to know because don't go by weight tables or bmi charts they will not tell you your medical obesity or medical health status. Because if you have a lot of fat, but it is outside the blood, how can it bother you? I'm Dr. Haley interrupting this podcast as a thank you for listening. Here's a coupon code you can use at HaleyNutrition.com during the month of August 2024. Get 20 bucks off your entire purchase of $150 or more. Many people order two bottles of aloe vera at a time. Consider upgrading to four bottles or adding Aya Green's vegetable and fruit powder. Most people don't get enough plant nutrients. Adding a scoop of greens to your daily routine is a great way to meet that need. And when you upgrade to four bottles of aloe vera, they ship a lot better, especially during the summertime. It'll still melt quite a bit in the mail for three days, but will arrive much colder than two bottles or use the coupon to try some of our other products. So head over to HaleyNutrition.com and use the code Dr. Haley. That's D-R-H-A-L-E-Y. One word, no spaces, for 20 bucks off your order of 150 or more now through the end of August 2024. If you're enjoying this podcast, please give it a thumbs up or leave a review, depending on which platform you're on. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the show. So a lot of fat, but it's outside the blood because right. it's inside the cells. How can right. it bother you? Okay. No, no, you have a storage area. If your storage area is full or empty, it doesn't matter. It is when the storage area is full, then it stays in the blood. That is what gives you trouble. For example, in diabetics, you give insulin, insulin forces the liver to convert the glucose into fat, and it is the fat that blocks the arteries going to the leg, going to the nerve cells or nerves and produce neuritis, going to the kidneys, produce kidney problem, heart attack, stroke, they are all come from fat, not from glucose. Okay. From stored fat or from fat in foods? Fat circulating in the blood. Well, regardless of whether you ate it or it was coming out of your cells. If you are a lean person, you have got 10 pound fat storage capacity. So if you gain 15 pounds, you are in trouble. Mm -hmm. If you are an obese person or inherited 100 pounds of fat storage capacity and you gain 50 pounds, Nothing. Everything is stored away. It cannot okay. bother the blood. Dr. John, are there healthy fats? Because a lot of people throw that around and they say, you know, avocado is a healthy fat and coconut oil and ghee. And these are healthy fats. Is that, is there a distinction or is fat fat? Well, the, though they are labels of what goes into the body. But what happens, what makes the difference is what happens in the body with any of these raw materials. That is based on your genetic uh, inheritance. See, when there is excess, the liver has three production lines. One line is the glucose, it goes straight into the blood. The second line is excess glucose converted into triglyceride, which is fat that we store. The third line goes to the cholesterol manufacturing line, either LDL or HDL come out. So depending on your genetic inheritance, each person will have a different value set in the blood. So it's based on how much fat storage capacity you have, what is line, what production line is active, and how much you put in your mouth. The two areas that contribute to weight are your fingers and your mouth. 
<laughs> if we can control those two, you are in control. <laughs> the further you keep your fingers from the mouth, the better, right? But again, you know, I could probably eat with my hands behind my back. I'd figure out a way. Uh, All so, right. What happened to your health? You had a health challenge and ha actually had a cancer diagnosis at some point. Yes. How yes. did that happen and what did you do about it? Well, that is a topic that may take another hour, but I'll give you a, a summary one of the blood tests, I was called, my doctor called and said, Dr. John, you have a problem. I said, what? You need to see an oncologist. I didn't feel anything bad. I said, why? Because your blood test shows there is cancer. And my life stopped right there. Luckily, I was in the bedroom. I could sit on the bed and I told my wife, this is a big problem. So I did and I, I, I had further tests which confirmed it. And I asked the oncologist, why did it happen? And he said, check the American Cancer Society website. So I went there and they said improper diet and lack of exercise. So I went to India to visit uh, my medical school. And when I was in training, there was no cancer hospital in that area. When I went back, I found two eight-story buildings, one for cancer for adults and another for children's cancer. So I asked the oncologist, why? And his answer was improper diet and lack of exercise. I contacted somebody in Europe, an oncologist, and he said, improper diet and lack of exercise. The same in South America, same in Africa. How can diet be improper and lack of exercise everywhere in the world for to explain increasing incidence of cancer? That did not make sense to me. So then I went back and looked at what is cancer. Cancer is uncontrolled multiplication of a cell. Every cancer starts with one stem cell. Stem cell is the mother cell that keeps producing baby cells. That is cancer. There's no functional arrangement. It is just production, number, not function. So how do we understand cancer? In order to understand cancer, we need to have an example of controlled multiplication. Okay? Can you give me an example of a controlled multiplication of a cell? Well, we're doing it every day. Uh, without thinking about it, our body is replacing damaged tissues as necessary. Exactly, exactly. But there is an even better example that I use. When you look at in a mirror, you are seeing an excellent example of controlled multiplication because each one of us is the product of one stem cell. Mm. The zygote, which was formed after the fertilization of the ovum with the sperm. Right? Amazing. Right? That fertilization does not take place in the womb. It takes place in the fallopian tube as the ovum is rolling down. Mm. After the fertilization, it takes a six-day journey for the ovum to come to the womb to be implanted. Do you know how many cells are there at that time in that zygote? Uh, I'm going to guess in six days, too many to count. 200 cells. Hmm. Do you know why 200? Each one of them will become a stem cell for our different organs and systems in the body. Okay. How did the zygote know to divide and divide to exactly 200 or around that number before implantation? Where did it get the knowledge from? And look at, we have two kidneys, both about the same size, and each one come from a stem cell, and they stop dividing when the shape and size is ideal. How does it happen? 
And suppose that control mechanism is damaged. It will keep on multiplying. And that is cancer. Hmm. So with that definition, why did that happen? Okay, that's a re- very good, excellent. That is why I wanted to find out. So every cell, it divides on demand. When the stem cell get a, okay, when you get a cut, as he said earlier, to healing, the cell that is suddenly exposed will send a message to the stem cell, my neighbor is missing. And the stem cell has two genes, one to activate cell division to produce baby cells, and another gene to stop the work. So there's a work activating gene and work stoppage gene. Okay. And so when the new cells meet each other, a message will be sent to the stem cell, neighbor is back, we don't need any more, and the growth inhibiting gene will issue work order stop. But sometimes that and, gene's on vacation? Well, in a way, if every gene has two copies, one from the father, one from the mother, if one gene is mutated, either because of radiation, infection, chemicals, whatever, then the other gene will take over. But if both genes are mutated, once the other gene orders the production, there's nobody to issue a stop work order. How do you fix those genes? That is what the gene therapies are coming in right now. They are looking at the signaling molecules from the gene. And that is what is the important work of cancer treatment right now, the gene-based. So what did you do about your cancer? Well, I took the chemotherapy. Luckily, no, the doctor said you have 85% chance of responding. But what you don't know is whether you belong to the 85 or the 15. Right. So luckily I am in the 85. So now... After five years after the treatment, the doctor will say, you are a cancer survivor. What does that mean? That does not mean you don't have any cancer cells in the body. All that means is with the available tests, we cannot detect a cancer cell. They are still hiding in my body. So, every cancer cell. Now, let me back up a little bit. Why are we afraid of cancer? Tell me why. Well, we're afraid because we assume that it's going to kill us. Exactly. How does cancer kill you? It does not produce any toxins. It does not go and invade the neighboring cells and destroy them like a bacteria. So what causes death in cancer? Yeah, something that is... well. Sometimes it would. Sometimes it could be the cancer, you know. In other words, um, the a lung cancer opens up the lung, and the lung doesn't work anymore. Um, no, 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 just a second. Okay. If the lung cancer is confined to one area, there's plenty of lung left to function. Mm-hmm. So why should it kill? All right. Um, so what then? What ends up killing? in the case of cancer? Let, that... let, let, let me ex- give you a different example. You, the cancer that kills or affects adult men, the number one cancer is prostate, prostate cancer. If you take 100 people with prostate cancer, only one third will die because of the cancer. Right. Another third will know that they have cancer, but it won't bother them except maybe some urinary obstruction. A third won't even know they have it. It Mm. They will die of something else. Then during autopsy, you find out they have cancer. Mm. So what is the difference between the first third that die and the other two thirds? Do they have a say which third they're in? 
what is the difference in why do they die the first third well i i've i've asked that same question but i think personally i think we have some say in it because i think as we you know affect our diet as an example right certain nutrients definitely have impact and affect certain things you might not know this i have an aloe vera company so i'm going to talk about aloe because i know about aloe vera what we know about it is it can increase tumor necrosis factor interferons and interleukins um we know that if there's a certain sugar molecule in aloe vera called mannose Right. And when a cancer cell tries to eat the mannose, it kind of binds to it, but can't actually consume it. And it ends up starving that particular cancer cell. Meanwhile, while that cancer cell is holding on to the mannose, it's kind of raising a flag saying, hey, macrophage, come get me. So we have some say in the foods that we consume, and we know that certain foods are going to do more harm, like yeah. sugar. Uh, and certain foods are, you know, like herbs and spices have anti-cancer properties and benefits and immune stimulating. And that's kind of what I, why I was wondering that about, about you. What did you do? Because you did the medical approach, which I'm not opposed to. You did the research and you found out 85%. That's pretty good. But I'm wondering if you also said, but what can I do on my own from a yes. complementary and alternative perspective? Absolutely. So let me back up a little bit. Why did the one third, why do one third of the prostate cancer people die? If your cancer is confined to one location, your body can handle it, just like any other organ. But when it starts having colonies or metastasis, what happens is those cells grab onto the nutrients that normal cells need to survive. Mm -hmm. So they literally starve the cells in vital organs, and that is how we die. So the number one thing is to confine the cancer to one area, preferably by reducing the number of cancer cells that can rob us of nutrients. And that is where the treatment comes in. Kill as many as you have, as you can, then prevent the rest from multiplying. And the, the second part is where the food or the dietary intervention come, come in. Comes. The Cancer cells use exactly the same nutrients as regular cells to divide. They need energy, they need raw material, they need the proteins, they take it from the regular food. But there's a difference. Our normal cells can produce energy from both fat and glucose. Cancer cells almost invariably look to get glucose for energy, to produce energy. And you use the term sugar. Most of the blood sugar, which is glucose, come not from the table sugar that we eat, but from the grains. So if you want to control the sugar availability of cancer cell, cut down on your grains. Mm. And that is what I did. Okay. That's why I don't use any grain-based products for lunch or dinner, only for breakfast and sometimes for cookies and uh, dessert. And, I like it. Yeah. And I've been, you know, like this for the last 14 years now. Now, you've also written a book about uh, children that have cancer. Yes. How was that different and why was it a separate book? Very interesting question. Usually, the average age of an adult with cancer is 60. Reason is, it takes accumulation of mutations. Remember, we talked about the two genes. To mutate the gene enough to make a difference and end up in cancer, 
you have to keep on adding mutations and it takes about six decades. But the average age of a child with cancer is six. The child has not lived long enough to you know, accumulate mutations. So why should a child have cancer? Well, no one should have cancer, but... No, 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 no. But why do we they will, get it, is the question. We will have every, in every human being, a cancer cell is formed almost every 10 mm -hmm. years. True. That's yeah, normal. Okay. Let me back up a little bit. Do you know when you have the maximum number of precancerous cells in your body? Probably at birth. Before birth. You're very good. You are the only one who has told me that. Well, because they're less differentiated. They're not. Not only that, the people who produce the new cells, the enzymes, they are all novices. They have never done it before. So if you get a bunch of people from the street to, to construct a home, they are going to make mistakes. So every newborn in their body, as they are being formed, there's so many mutations, but nature is aware of that. Nature has put the immune system to hunt. There is a group of white cells called natural killer cells. They hunt down cancer cells and destroy them. 99% of the precancerous cells are destroyed before the baby is born. But some do survive. Mutated cells. And some of them become stem cells. And if they get an activation order, you have cancer in a child. Or the stem cell that the child had can get mutated because of radiation or infection or something like that, and then they produce the same result. Got it. Got it. Now, does that book have a happy ending? Is there hope for the child with cancer? Again, if you detect early, nowadays there are so many treatments coming up. Childhood leukemia is practically now under control. They can control it. And lymphoma, leukemia, those are the two common. The main problem is the brain cancer, the glioblastomas and things like that. They are still have to work on it. Yeah, yeah. Now, before we cancel, what did I leave out that we should have talked about? Well, the, there is, in medical field, the average science knowledge of a individually is at about six to eight grade level. The medical field has advanced so much. There is a gap between the average knowledge and the scientific knowledge. That gap is getting filled by information spread in the social media. So how to filter out? Hmm. It is so difficult. Now into that mix is added AI generated information. Yeah. It's almost impossible for an average person to understand which is right, which is wrong. That is where I admire people like you. You take the time to understand and educate. Yeah. And I hope more people will listen to people like you rather than it's very difficult. Thank you. Thank you. What faith did you grow up in? I'm sorry? What what faith or religion did you grow up in? In the Christian faith. Christian faith? Yeah, okay. Um, because we have this knowledge in us, the life that's in us, that did what you said earlier when two cells came together and divided into 200 by a specific point in time. And we don't know how to do that. It just happens by this wonderful knowledge, this wonderful power, the knowledge yes. of God right. in us yes. doing all of these things. And I, I, I think that when we're trying to use the, the God filter, when it comes to what we you know, learn from Google and it's AI generated, th there's a filter. Put it through the filter. 
does this seem right? Does this seem real? If not, let me investigate a little bit further because we are being programmed and AI is a very scary thing. And I, yeah. I, I, it's terrifying because people are going to take it hook, line and sinker and they're going to believe what they read and see. But, you know, we have the knowledge in us will tell you if something's wrong. You just got to listen to it. Kind of like paying attention to our hunger. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So the, the, the problem comes for an average person. Our environment shapes our initial beliefs and disbeliefs. So we can all, you know, if you look at every re, re, uh, faith or every religion, they will all agree on one thing. There's only one creator. That everybody. Yeah. But each religion has a separate way of reaching the creator. And each one will say, mine is the not only the right way, the only way. Yeah. So that is human created. The creator did not create multiple ways. Right. So how do we choose which one is the right one that our environment, our upbringing is, has to do with it? Yeah. So how do we know how to pay attention or what to pay. Now, as you said, the AI is going to make it even more complicated. Yeah, yeah, but I was curious because I know there's a lot of different religions in India. And, you know, when I meet people and, you know, you're just a joy and a pleasure and stuff, I like to know, you know, what is behind that. And it's nice, it's refreshing. So yeah. great energy, well, well, absolute wonderful energy. You're doing a good yeah. work. You, you know, our environment shapes our thinking. And some people go out of that and make, make your, their own decisions, their own thinking, their own knowledge, their own interpretation. And those who can do that without hurting others, that is what we need to do. Yeah. We don't know actually why we are here. So we have a right to enjoy our existence here without hurting others. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, that's a good word. It's like the health freedom with responsibility. I like it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you put it nicely. Good stuff. What's your uh, best place to find your books? Um, I know your website is drjohnhealth.com and you have other websites too. Well, everything will go to drjohnonhealth.com on health. All right. And I'll make sure on the video, this is going to be below your beautiful picture there for the whole video. So don't worry Thank about you. that, but we'll also have links below the video in the description. We'll have links on the podcast. Uh, everywhere that you find this content, there's going to be links to Dr. John's website uh, and some of your social media. I see you're very active on social media. So good stuff. Dr. John, thank you so much for enlightening us today. Dr. Haley, I thank you for having me. And again, I thank you for your interest in educating your followers. And I wish them, I tell people, take charge of your health. It is your responsibility. You, can, you should ask questions and make your own decision as what is best for you and people around you. Beautiful. Well said. Dr. John, blessings to you. Same to you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode today on The Dr. Haley Show. Make sure to hit subscribe on whichever platform you are listening to this. If this episode made you think of someone, go ahead, take a screenshot, and share this exact episode with them. You can catch the show notes for this episode on www.drhaley.com. If you want to geek out with Dr. Michael Haley on other radical health topics, be sure to check out his YouTube channel where he posts exclusive video content. All the details are at www.drhaley.com and we can't wait to hang out with you on the next episode.